Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hi, I'm Jenny Anderson. I'm the Senior Program Officer for South Asia here at the Center for International Private Enterprise. I'm sitting in today for Ken Jakes. Um, who is on a lovely vacation somewhere. Today I'm with Ali Salman, who wears many hats and has been a longtime friend of Sipes. He is the CEO of Ideas, he is the founder and on the board of trustees of the Policy Research Institute on Market Economy in Pakistan. Um, he has also helped establish the Islam and Liberty Network. Um, thanks for joining us today, Ali. Thank you, Jenny. It's always a pleasure to visit uh, friends in, in DC, visit SAIP, uh, yeah. and uh, working for, 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 as you rightly said, uh, as, as uh, support and friends for many years now. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to see you again. Yeah. Um, I mean, usually you're based these days in Kuala Lumpur, or, and you travel often to Islamabad. What brings you to the US this time? So I um, was invited uh, by Acton Institute um, in Grand Rapids uh, a week ago for their annual Acton University, um, which is a four days uh, conference mm. consisting of uh, lectures, mm. uh, mainly discussing relig religion and liberty. Okay, interesting uh, topic. Uh, largely from uh, a Christianity perspective, mm. Uh, but this year they have started um, what is called uh, Islamic Outreach Program. Okay. So they invited um, a few uh, think tank leaders and, and academics from the Muslim world uh, to be a part of a broader discussion hmm. on, on religion and liberty. Yeah. So it was quite interesting uh, to right. listen to very diverse perspective. Yeah. And, and, and you were like, invited because of your connection with the Islam of helping to found the Islam yes, and Liberty Yes, I'm Network. a founding, one of the founding members of yeah. uh, Islam and Liberty Network, uh, which was uh, initially uh, a network of uh, like-minded uh, individuals um, who, are, who believe that uh, Islam uh, favors the foundations of free society, mm -hmm. uh, such as uh, 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 liberal democracy, free markets, and uh, religious freedom. Yeah. Um, and uh, now this is a registered and a legal entity in, mm. in Malaysia. Mm. And so um, and that's what I've been doing in Malaysia, wearing two hats there. Mm. As um, uh, now I'm CEO of the network, uh, trying to establish um, a, a global program um, on, on these lines um, and also uh, being in charge of ideas. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, to just talk about the network for one more second before we go on to ideas. I mean, it feels like right now is it, it's important to have these conversations talking about Islam and liberty and that market economy is not antithetical to Islam. So how, how do you feel your message is getting out? How do you feel the, like, the audience that you're speaking to, are, are, do you feel people are receptive? Or at least the people in Grand Rapids at the university you were at, what, did you feel like people are eager to hear this message, or are they questioning it? Like, what has been your response? Um, I think I have found a lot of eagerness oh, and uh, almost excitement um, uh, from the friends I met recently at Grand Rapids. And um, uh, because the normal perception when we talk about Islam is uh, that, um, okay, it, it, rest it, it, it restricts freedoms. Right. Um, uh, but uh, as we, as as Muslims, we understand that it um, depends uh, fairly and large degree on uh, on your interpretation and your understanding of the text, right. and your understanding of the history of Islamic civilization itself, which yeah. was uh, which was pro freedom, pro liberty, um, and uh, has hosted cultures and civilizations. Um, and promoted free trade and material right. prosperity um, right. in, in its um, in its uh, mainlands, um, which is a, a, but which if you look at the Muslim majority countries now, mm -hmm. or um, or the uh, views about Islam in the West, it is not consistent right. with the, with this history, not not consistent with the uh, right. this view. Right. Um, so we were doing, um, you know, we have been doing uh, international conferences um, each, each right. year. Um, last year, for instance, this conference was held in Kuala Lumpur mm. 
and this was on the democratic transitions in the Muslim world. Hmm. Uh, if you see what's had happening in, let's say, post-Arab Spring environment. Right. Um, so the democratic transition is real, it's happening, but uh, it's not coming up with uh, always uh, desirable uh, consequences. Right. And people still talk about um, economic hardships. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I think if you, if you look at how the uh, so-called Islamic political parties have also joined the democratic um, right. uh, bandwagon, it shows that at least the idea that uh, democracy can be um, uh, a part of the greater Islamic discourse mm -hmm. is now well accepted. Yeah. So that's no more a challenge. But um, given the fact that um, the, uh, uh, the sometimes these religious interpretations can actually also lead to unfreedoms, right. uh, th that's, that's, a living, uh, that's a living challenge for many of these societies. Right. Right, exactly. And you mentioned the international conferences. If people wanted to learn more or possibly attend one of your international conferences, um, where should they go to find out more information? Uh, we have a website. Um, <laughs> Great. And uh, this is called um, islamandlibertynetwork.org. Okay. Um, previous, uh, l the last conference which I mentioned uh, was um, actually also supported by, by SIP. Yeah. And um, and we uh, I think we had a uh, excellent uh, uh, presentations from about twenty countries hmm. um, That's great. who represented both the conceptual and also the uh, practical dimensions of democracy in Muslim majority countries. Wow. And uh, our sixth conference uh, would be on the economic aspect, so building an Islamic case for open markets hmm. is the title. Ah, very and um, it's being organized in Pakistan. Excellent. And uh, there is um, uh, also a degree of local ownership. Hmm. Uh, already last year, conference was hosted by a very credible Islamic Research Institute, hmm. Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies in Malaysia. Oh. Uh, and the sixth conference is going to be hosted in Islam in in the Islamic International University in Islamabad. Oh, great! Uh, in an institute called Iqbal Institute of Research and Dialogue. Okay. And they have become the major sponsor for this conference. Wow, wonderful. Well, I hope to see you there. <laughs> I'm looking forward to your, well, yeah. you, should, you should definitely should. visit because yeah. SAIP has long presence in, right, in, Pakistan. in Pakistan. Yeah, and exactly. it's, it's a topic which uh, also of deep interest uh, yeah. to SAIP, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So to move on to your other work, I mean, you were in Pakistan when I first met you four years ago. It was when you were based, you were working with Prime in Pakistan. And since you've moved to Kuala Lumpur to be the CEO of Ideas, um, I mean, maybe, I mean, it seems like recent news in Malaysia has been, there's been huge change. After 61 years of the ruling party ha having a stronghold over Malaysia, there's been a giant surprise election change and yeah. they were toppled. Um, maybe given this surprising event and what this means for Malaysia and the, and the region concerning democracy mm. development, maybe you could talk a little bit about what you see is happening in Malaysia as well as the role of ideas. Yeah. So Ideas uh, Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs was established in Malaysia back in 2010 uh, by Wan Sepul Wan and. Um, uh, he has recently um, resigned uh, and joined politics. Mm. Um, and actually, many of uh, Ideas' friends and fellows um, are now active in, in politics. Wow. And um, uh, in fact, now part of the government. Uh, Great. And so it's a, it's, it's a very different experience uh, from uh, a think tank point of view. Mm. Uh, for many years, Ideas has been talking about improved governance, uh, good governance, uh, transparency, uh, democratic reforms, election commission reforms, along with many other good civil society organizations uh, which, uh, which, uh, which exist in, in Malaysia today. Mm. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a very exciting time to be in Malaysia right now yeah, sure. and, um, and uh, in, to be a part of that greater discourse. Um, I think the, uh, the democratic uh, shift or transformation which Malaysia is experiencing uh, shows uh, the confidence of people in, in, in democratic systems. Hmm. And this shows that uh, despite of all the, the limitations which um, 
were there in terms of uh, the institutions. Uh, still, there were uh, there were some strong points. Let's say uh, a functioning election commission, which mm -hmm. was able to uh, actually conduct these elections mm -hmm. and come out with with the results, uh, despite there were so many reservations and misgivings about whether they're going to be actual transfer of power or not. Uh, I remember on the election night um, when the results were were already out. Mm -hmm. And I was congratulating my friends and colleagues that, mm. well, it's a historic moment for Malaysia after yeah. 61 years. Right. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, in a peaceful manner, there is a change in the government. And no one, even at that point, was actually uh, in a state of belief. <laughs> and right. they were, everyone, no, 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 wait. Yeah, wait right. something till something happened. Yeah. Wait, and then the prime minister would call a meeting of emergency council. Right, right. Wait, and the king would not announce it. Yeah, right. So, so the, there were like two days of uncertainty wow. before uh, uh, the king uh, invited uh, Tun Mahathir to form the government. Wow. And uh, and people were sort of um, uh, very uh, uncertain till that happened. Yeah. But that's now, I think that's now uh, behind us. Um, yeah. And uh, this is certainly a great shining example for other democracies. Definitely. How, what do you think led to the toppling of the, I mean, a 61 year rule? Like, how, what, what was the catalyst for this change? Was it long time coming? It, was, it, was there a certain issue that really provoked voters to be like, this is, we've had enough, we can't take it my, anymore? In, yeah, in my view, the change started uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, actually. Oh. Interesting. Uh, when, paradoxically speaking, uh, when um, Mahathir actually um, uh, ousted his deputy prime minister, hmm. uh, Anwar Ibrahim, at that time, and Anwar Ibrahim uh, fo founded his own political party. Oh, interesting. And so there was this um, uh, this feeling, this this uh, this craving for change mm. in the nation which they started uh, demonstrating in elections mm -hmm. subsequently. And so uh, in ba already in 2008, elections in 2008 and elections in 2013, mm -hmm. the number of popular votes, the turnout, was going the other way. Hmm. And in 2013, uh, the number of total vote counts were already against the AMNO. Mm. But the way the constituencies were divided, uh, it still were, were the, the, that mm. shift was still not enough to change the government. Yeah. And then uh, comes in Mahathir mm. uh, in a very dramatic f manner, mm. and he becomes the the uh, the symbol of change himself, mm. where it, people initially in the past had associated him with the old system, with right. system with more controls. Right. Uh, but he, he sort of uh, uh, becomes a hope of, of all of this mega change. Uh, and before him, I think the opposition was fractured. Mm -hmm. And people were ready to, to move out. And people were sh showing him, uh, sh people were giving for change. But the opposition leadership was not a le united. Mm -hmm. So Mahathir did that. Hmm. Um, and, and then he was able to convert very complex, uh, let's say, ec economic and political issues hmm. into simple messages. Hmm. Uh, goods and services tax, uh, GST, he said that this has led to economic hardships. Right. Although, in, in our view, this was not empirically correct. <laughs> But he was able to deliver that message. Right. And then he was able to focus a uh, debate around uh, former Prime Minister Najib mm -hmm. uh, alleged corruption. Right. Uh, yeah. What was it? Today like, he's arrested. Right, exactly. That was other news coming out that the former Prime Minister was arrested on corruption charges. What has been, I mean, the role of IDEA in sort of changing the way citizens view government and government performance? as well as the role of corruption and anti-corruption efforts. Have these played an integral part of this sort of long, long-awaited change? Yes, I think so. It's, it's ideas is not um, alone in that, um, um, yeah. in that change process. There are many other uh, civil society actors. There are um, independent um, uh, media houses, especially mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the web. Um, and which have been talking about these changes. There have been 
business leaders who have been talking about um, yeah. uh, some some uh, you know the ch change itself. And um, when it comes to the role of think tanks, then I think we have been providing that intellectual ammunition mm -hmm. for a number of years. Uh, so actually, b just before the elections, there was the uh, a large uh, gathering in which the Pakatan Harapan, the opposition then opposition alliance, mm. announced its manifesto, mm. and they acknowledged the role uh, and the reports which Ideas has pr prepared oh, great. over the last few years, yeah. along with other groups. Uh, and and we uh, were happy to see that many of those recommendations, especially on the institutional uh, reform side were made a part of the manifesto. Ah, and and now they stand committed to it in terms right. of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, when we talk about corruption, it's, uh, it's, it's very important that those institutions, MACC, there's uh, Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, mm. um, is independent. Right. And, and I think the, 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 the directions are very positive at this point in time. Mm. We are moving towards that. The, there have been several institutional changes announced already Mm -hmm. uh, to that effect, uh, which is going to be very helpful in in the, in the future. Yeah. yeah, no, it sounds like tremendous change. It does sound like an exciting time to be in Malaysia and watching all this. How do you feel for the region? Do you think like this election, this major upset toppling a 61-year-old regime, um, will this ripple out across, like through Asia, uh, maybe down going towards South Asia? Do you see any regional effects of this change? Yeah, there's a there's a lot of uh, like uh, I think undemocratic elements are still strong in in the region, mm. um, and um, we have uh, military juntas, we have right. uh, um, you know single man dictatorial uh, rules in in the region. Right. It's not going to be easy because I think all politics is very local. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, but there is a discussion, for instance, in, in Singapore, hmm. that um, Singapore is another example of same right. party rule. Right, um, exactly. That whether it can change. Um, right. But that's, in my view, it's, it's premature to say um, yeah. to th that whether this democratic uh, transition can help effect on other countries. Right, right. Because a lot but, of countries in the region, I think, still look very much towards Singapore saying, this is the model we want to follow. We want economic prosperity. We should be more like Singapore, which from a democracy point of view is perhaps not the best model to be following. I think you said something very important, Jenny. The, you see, Malaysia has been uh, on on forefront of economic development in the region, hmm. besides Singapore, after hmm. Singapore maybe. And for a large population, fairly large population, in, in compared with the many other countries, um, Malaysia has done quite well mm. economically. Uh, Malaysia has also quite done socially. It brought down poverty rates from wow. about 50% wow. in 1971 to 0.3% now. Wow, that's amazing. So this happened because Malaysia was part of global trade. Yeah, and, and, and despite... A uh, heavy presence of the government in the economy through the state-owned enterprises. Right. A part of the economy has remained very open, hmm. competitive, hmm. and well integrated. Hmm. So, uh, uh, so you have economic freedom first, and sort of political freedom later. Yeah, right. And, and this is not to suggest that Mala in Malaysia there was absolutely no democracy, because at least there was procedurally there was right. democracy. Right. And uh, Malaysia happens to be the only only Muslim majority country in the world, which has this record of elections without a break. Wow! In the last sixty or sixty uh, that five years. That is tremendous. Yeah, no other country can. And so, claim no that. other country in the right. Muslim world can actually claim that. Interesting. Yeah. And and that is important for uh, for for a nation mm -hmm. to to achieve that resilience. Right. Uh, and also exhibit that that patience um, right. to. Uh, to bring that change, yeah. but I think if you focus too much on maybe on on uh, uh, too early on on political uh, freedom and your economy is weak, mm -hmm. and if people are not too satisfied right. with the jobs, right. then bringing uh, this change. I mean, look at what is happening in Arab Spring, post Arab right. Spring, which uh, is an, another case in point. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, when we are seeing that. We saw political changes. We saw democratic uh, right. uh, upheavals, political right. upheavals. Right. But since the economies are weak right. and economic freedom is rather weak in, in most of these countries, right. 
we are seeing an instability. Yeah, definitely. And we, right. people are still frustrated. Yeah, no, if people can't feed their families or see a brighter future for their children economically, this talk of democracy doesn't really make sense. People yeah, are just like, exactly. first things first. Yeah, so, that's true. So we have both. Um, yeah, so that's, it's exciting time. Um, so maybe, um, let's see. Uh, oh, maybe to talk a little bit more about Malaysia and the corruption side of things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's inc there's a scandal that perhaps shaped public opinion, the IMDB scandal, um, as well as looking at Chinese investments. Is, mm. Is there, do you feel these, is there something you'd like to talk about with that? Is there, have these influenced the way that citizens look towards their government? So um, one of the, one of the campaign uh, themes which uh, Prime Minister Mahathir led was um, uh, this one MDB scandal, mm. uh, which unfolded back in 2015. Mm. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a government-owned uh, sovereign wealth fund hmm. um, with investments overseas. Oh, okay. Uh, but then uh, it soon led into trouble uh, when uh, it was found out that there was um, uh, a significant amount of $750 million was transferred hmm. to the personal account, bank account of then Prime Minister. Oh. And then um, a worldwide investigation, including the Department of Justice, oh, really? started. Oh. Um, and uh, that almost, uh, at, even at that point, uh, the, the, although the investigation didn't name uh, Najib at that point, but they mentioned uh, a Malaysian uh, official number one. Okay. As directly yeah, implicated. I see. So, um, so it, was, it was there, but... The important part of the political landscape is that it was not becoming a public issue. Mm -hmm. Because Najib administration was telling the people, well, you have your jobs, <laughs> you yeah. have your allowances, right. Right. Uh, you know, you have, you right. know, you have nice things, you have goodies. Right. So stop and so let's, let's, <laughs> let's, not ask, let's not ask tough questions. Yeah. And then the media, there was a media clam down, there was this... Uh, wow. Uh, anti-fake news bill was passed okay. just before the election, hmm. uh, giving very strong signals to the public at large that, well, do not criticize the government. Interesting. But I think what, what did happen during the election campaign that the issues like 1MDB and greater issues of corruption became a part of political discourse. Right. And that influenced the rural uh, opinion, rural voters' opinion, right. to a fair degree. Uh, and also to the urban voters, which helped then winning uh, votes uh, for that. So that economic discussion um, uh, or economic reform discussion has to be packaged in a way which appeals to the voters right, right. Uh, to make the change really, to make the change happen. Yeah, yeah, know that the issue was brought and that citizens, that citizens were able to be, um, to understand the issue, that the media had the space to... Yeah convey the information, regardless of the clampdown. I mean, yeah. It seems significant. It is. It um, is. I would have loved to talk about your work in Pakistan and our long work together with uh, SIP and Prime working together, but I think we've run out of time, sadly. <laughs> so, Ali, it was a pleasure speaking with you. I hope you come back to D.C. very soon and speak with SIP again. Thank you and, so much, Jenny. Yeah, thank you. Listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at site.org. That's C-I-P-E.org. Thanks for listening.